Boys with Matt Pinfield. Today's guest, John Feldman. Hey everybody, it's Matt Pinfield. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. And I know that sounds kind of like a depressing title, but it's really not. It was something I came up with during the pandemic. Uh, it was the name of a Humphrey Bogart movie, a Smithereen song, a New Order song. And I was in a lonely place when I was by myself locked down during the pandemic. But man, I am in good spirits. I'm so happy we started this show then and it's been continuing weekly. And uh, we've had some amazing guests, like my guest today, who I consider my friend, you know, for over a quarter of a century, like over 25 years, we met, I uh, heard a song that he had wrote, fell in love with it, was playing on the radio in New York City, had him on as a guest on my TV show, 120 Minutes, I was a huge fan of his bands. And uh, it's been an amazing journey and ride since then. And uh, we've remained friends all these years. And I'm so proud of all the incredible work he's done as an artist, as a producer, uh, as an A&R guy, as an activist, all the different things that he's done. So without any wait, I'm going to get right into it. I've got John Feldman here. John, good to see you, man. How's everything today? Yeah, Matt. So Yo, good to see you. What's up, my you're brother? All, you're all fit and toned up and skinny. I fucking love it. You look great. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man. You know, I'll tell you, John, I, it's uh, it, number one, it's a sobriety thing. And, you know, I, I after I got, it took me about eight months to walk without a cane uh, when I first got hit by a car about gets getting close to the two year anniversary. But, you know, I'm hiking now, working out. You know what I mean? Uh, devoted to my sobriety and i'm feeling really really good it's all about the music and, and family and, and friends you know what i mean the things that matter in life i do and just on a side note you know goldfinger's second album single was called this lonely place on our second album so we've got there's another song you can reference yes you know? and i do love it it's called this Lonely place what i and also love was how nice you were that you guys because we debuted uh, here in your bedroom on 120 Minutes, I know that when you were working with the director, you guys put my last name in as a code in the video that was like the alien video. It was basically based on a sci-fi alien type situation where you were running through the this spaceship. And uh, one of the codes was P-I-N-F-I-E-L-D, my last name. It was really one of the coolest things ever. <laughs> I, was so, I was so blown away by that. But I mean, Johnny, goes back to, you know, uh, here and here in your bedroom. And uh, somebody like literally called me up and saying, you got to hear this track when I was in the music department at MTV. And I said, oh, my God, this is one of the best songs that I've heard in a long time. And I was so it was so immediately infectious. And I loved it. Uh, and, you know, I said, let's get these guys on the show. And then we became friends right from the first time you guys came to 120 Minutes. So we did. That was such a great it was such a great time in music. Just every time we go to New York City. Um, I mean, just seeing you and just being on the show and music was just in the forefront of everyone's mind. I mean, I remember we played Irving Plaza that that weekend that we were on your show and it was just such a big deal just to be in New York City and the whole thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, were we on tour with uh, with No Doubt? I don't I don't even remember that. No, maybe, maybe not that early. I mean, that we probably were on during that we, we were on Conan O'Brien and our drummer picked him up from behind all the way up and flipped him over his back. Conan almost crushed his skull on the monitor and almost died live on television. It was like, oh it was such an amazing time period where you could actually be live and have these events where so many things now are pre recorded and things are just, it's just not the excitement isn't quite the same as when you're on live television. Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, that's crazy. And that was Darren who did that. And that was, uh, Pretty amazing, you know. That Darren lifted him up, right? I mean, that was the the crazy. Yeah, Darren's Darren is. Uh, I think he's like six foot two, and Conan's like six foot seven. So it was like a tall. When he had him on his shoulders, it was like a tall building just coming down. And I saw it in slow motion. I'm like, no. I can imagine. 
<laughs> that must have been amazing. You're like, don't do that to us. We don't. We want to be on NBC again. And you yeah, we were, we were canceled. Our band got canceled from every single network television show. We weren't, on, and no doubt went on the next day on Letterman. And and the whole staff said, you're not allowed to touch the host. Like you're just not allowed to. It was like a really big deal. Like all the lawyers surrounded the building and wouldn't let us out. They thought that we had done it intentionally to try and hurt the, you know, hurt the host. And it was just like our drummer being a just being a drummer. You know, like drummers do. Very Keith Moon, like in a sense that you didn't know what was going to happen next, right? No, exactly. You know, and you know, the Who were definitely one of my favorite, all-time favorite bands. And I remember they I think it was the Smothers Brothers they were on in the 60s where Keith Moon put like a quarter stick of dynamite in his kick drum and didn't tell the guitar player Pete Townsend about it and exploded on live television as well. I think that was probably part of the appeal of why Darren wanted to do it. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy because, yeah, with Townsend, I think that might have, it, it, it almost, I think it damaged his ears a little bit. Uh, luckily, not completely. But yeah, yeah that was, he was not expecting that from Keith. It's, it's amazing stuff. Speaking of which, I remember in your old house in Marina Del Rey, John, you had the greatest, like, who picture in a frame of them when they're real young that was up over your drum set in like that one guest room that you used to record drums before you like built out a full studio. Like people don't realize they know you. I mean, listen, I mean, you with all the records combined you've worked on, you've sold maybe 35 million copies of records worldwide. But I mean, you li literally started producing people in your home. You're making records in your house. I remember the drum set set up there. And that great picture of the who as young guys, right, right over it. Remember? Yeah, black and white picture with the target. You know, it had him. I, I, it was probably, um, I don't know, probably like pre Quadrophenia era. You know, like pre Live at Leeds. I don't know, just this old, just old school, like probably 1967 photo of the who that was just like my mode. It was a really big poster too. It like took up probably like 20 percent of my wall space in the studio. It's just incredible that you remember this, man. I. I admire your memory, dude. I don't, I didn't even remember that who photo until now, but you know, like the idea of here in your bedroom and that song that you heard that you put on your show. I mean, it was like, like everything. And when you're struck with, with inspiration and something like hits you as hard as I got hit when I wrote that song back in probably 1993, I wrote that song, you know, it came out of me in about 20 minutes, like the whole song, the whole song start to finish kind of came out of me and it was all these influences that I'd kind of gone through my whole life, you know, seeing my first concert was the English beat and bow, wow, wow. And so there's definitely that kind of twist and crawl drum fill in the beginning, yeah. beginning from the English beat into these social distortion, Southern California, punk rock, bad religion kind of chords in the, in the chorus, like this whole thing kind of came out of me as one, you know, you know, kind of piece of inspiration really quickly. And that song changed everything for me, you know? And it's like, I wouldn't have been able to, I mean, ultimately the the publishing that I got, I mean, I think it was probably like, I, I think I got a $20,000 publishing advance, which I was able to put down on that house, which was, I had never seen $20,000 my whole life. It was like an, an, a, a huge amount of money, you know? And so I put it down on this house that was owned by this crackhead that I was renting at the time. And so she just needed the money. We went to a bank, we needed 10% down on the house. I think the house at the time was worth about $400,000. So my 20 grand procured the house and we were able to buy this house, which I built the studio on my own. I just went to Home Depot. I got a bunch of egg crates and a bunch of uh, foam and super, like I basically just got, just sprayed a bunch of glue on the wall, that spray glue and put a bunch of like, um, you know, styrofoam and foam on the wall. And it was like, we made that studio that you saw. And that's where I made Story of the Years, Page Avenue. I made the used first album, the first, you know, two messed albums I made there. I made Open Your Eyes, the Goldfinger record there. So we had, we, I, I did a lot of records in this little room. It's probably the size of the room I'm sitting in now that you could barely fit one bed, but I had a drum set in the corner. I put a, I put a 57 microphone down the hallway as my room mic, you know, because yeah. I just didn't have a room. And I just basically had maybe four microphones on the drum set. And that's what I used to make. I mean, that first used record also changed my life as a producer. I mean, it put me on the map as a producer. So that little room 
I don't know. My, my wife hated it because I mean, we would do drums at three in the morning. My neighbors were always like, what are you guys doing in there? You know, that was really <laughs> professional records. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. That used record, by the way, sounded so good, you know, boy, uh, Box of Sharp Objects and The Taste of Ink, which was that first single off that record, was just undeniably great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really, you know, finding that band was like definitely uh, a game changer for me. But it all started, you know, I mean, it started before that. I mean, I was in a band and I was signed and I toured the world and Tommy Lee produced our album and and all that. You know, I was I worked at Aardvark selling used clothes and then yeah, I, got, I got signed and then we got dropped and I had to go back to selling uh, closed at Nana on the promenade, this like punk rock shoe store. And so I, I had it all and it all went away. And so by the time I wrote here in your bedroom, I knew that there was something magical about to come. I knew that song was special. And so by the time K rock added it, you started playing it. Like it changed without that. None of this would have been possible because I met the used because I was on tour with my band. And so, I mean, when I think about my history, like, you know, Steve Jobs says, or used to say, you could only connect the dots looking backwards. Nobody has a crystal ball. And I could have never been where I'm at had it not been for working at the shoe store. I met the girl that I had a crush on. I wrote here in your bedroom about her because I was working at the shoe store. And then that song became what it was. My band went on tour. The used were fans of Goldfinger. And I met them because they came to our show in Salt Lake City. And then I was able to sign them and produce their album. So if my life was any different, it wouldn't have turned out the way that it is, which I mean, in, in my case, I, I just, I couldn't want for a better life than I have. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And you've, I mean, you're the way that you, it's all progressed. But we should go backwards for a second and say that your first band that was signed was the Electric Love Hogs. And, you know, a couple other guys came out of that band too. You had Bobby, who was the drummer in Orgy, and Dave Kushner, of course, from Velvet Revolver, right? So um, you guys, and that's always like the first time around. It's, is it, would you say that was a lesson learned kind of thing? Um, what, what did it feel like when you first got signed with Electric Love Hogs? Did you feel like, hey, this is going to happen? And, where was it all these different, you know, chain of events, you know, uh, because I know when it comes to a record company, you and I know this more than anything, everything kind of ducks have to align. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah. you're, you're in our guy, leads, you know, or, or, you know, there's something else comes out and the label's pushing this one, your record, you know, it's great, but something else becomes a priority. It's so much craziness. Um, Tell me about the Electric Love Hogs, if you can sum it up in a very short period. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, look, the Love Hogs were, uh, you know, I loved, like I said, the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Fishbone and all these live bands that just put a put on the show. So our band was very, I mean, I was always head walking and doing flips off the, the balcony and all that. That was like our thing. And we had so many bands open for us, Matt. We had Alice in Chains. Pearl Jam used to be called Mookie Blaylock. They opened for our band. We took Rage Against the Machine out on their first tour. We took Corn out on their first tour. We had all these amazing acts open for us. I mean, Maynard from Tool used to be our mascot. So he used to come on stage during Love Hog shows dressed as a chef with a lawn blower and shoot hot dogs into the crowd when we play shows. I mean, that was like his gig before Tool really took off. So we had the guys in, we had two of the guys in Fishbone produce our record, Tommy Lee produced our record, all these different characters from Los Angeles music history involved with that project. But in the end, like I said, song is king and we didn't have the songs we ended up breaking up and getting dropped from the label. And I went back to working at the shoe store. And then and, and that's when I rediscovered, I, I opened up my old record collection and just started listening to all the shit from the Avengers from San Francisco, all the way to the Buzzcocks from Manchester. And just, you know, kind of like started writing songs like I knew how to do. My first band was called Family Crisis. We toured with Seven Seconds back in the day. We played shows with Bad Religion back in the early 80s. So that was like the, my, my heart and soul of who I was lived in that world. And I went back and then all these bands, you know, really, you know, no effects. I, I had met Fat Mike. I tried to get Fat Mike to sign Goldfinger. And I, I don't think he really listened to the demo cassette or maybe he did. And it just wasn't his thing. But like, you know, I, I fell in love with all those new kind of like epitaph bands like Pennywise and Rancid and all those bands like I just fell in love with. And we just kind of came up, you know, in the early 90s, the same time. And that's just kind of what happened with Goldfinger. And Goldfinger was the band that was meant to break for me. Yeah, and it surely did. And at that point, you know, it's one of the craziest things of all is 
And it really explains your work ethic, John. Like, no, I, I don't know anybody who works harder than you. I mean, there's a lot of hardworking people. We know that you have to put hard work into everything you do. I certainly consider myself a hardworking guy. But man, that year that you did, I think was it 285 shows or 300 and something? We played, yeah, we played 385 shows in 1996. You know, we had, we had done it. I did a tour with the Buzzcocks, which was like full circle for me. I did a tour with No Doubt, a tour with Bad Religion. We played a bunch of shows, shows with Fishbone. All these bands that I like, you know, idolized as a kid, I was now opening for. And it was like this crazy year and I just couldn't say no. Like I wasn't going to say no to any of it because I just didn't want to go back to selling shoes. I'm like... I'll say yes to everything. So we would play these matinee shows at noon for like a radio station or for the under 18 crowd. And then we play a nighttime show. And so we would, we had two days off in 96. We had Christmas, Christmas day off and we had um, thanks, Thanksgiving day off and we played every other day. And then some of those multiple days. So I was so grateful just to not have to work retail for $5 an hour. Like I was done with that life. Yeah, and you guys broke the Guinness Book of World Records, which I, I think you still hold that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for a touring band, 385 shows in a year for a touring band. I don't know if it's – at the time, we definitely broke that world record, which was like – I mean, fuck yeah, brother. Yeah, I'd be very proud of that. That was amazing. But that was your work ethic, and it always has been. You know, and, and the thing about that was great. I mean, you put everything into your live performance as well. But what I love is – how you made that transition, not only to, to doing a and r and to producing. Um, and what was that? Was that because you really know how you wanted your records to sound and became such a part of everything that you knew you could do this for other people? And you also mentioned Song is King, which you are all about songs being, I mean, having that that something, that hook, that 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 thing that makes you remember it. Because I mean, again. All the press in the world doesn't mean it's a good tune, right? I mean, you know, they can get all the hype in the world, but if there's no song, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you and I have seen that a hundred times uh, or more. Yeah, I, you uh, know, in, in, in the end, I, I, I do. Uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's like I have a lot of energy, and so I'm always kind of, you know, and my ADD works or whatever I have. It's like if I have something I'm interested in, I can focus on it like nothing else. Everything else. That I'm, things I'm not interested in, I just, I don't have the time, you know? So for me, it's like when I'm working in the studio, if I'm focusing on building sound design or I'm tracking a vocal or I'm recording a guitar player, whatever it is I'm doing, if there's like people behind me writing lyrics or talking about a YouTube clip or something, the more that's going on, the more focused I can be. And I think that's part of it. You know, part of it is my, my father telling me I was never going to make it in the music business. Part of it is my healthy fear of having to go back to working retail. I mean, all that combined, you know, drives me to never, I mean, I don't really take days off once in a while. Like I'll, I'll take my family out of town for a weekend, but I really, you know, it's not like you, it's not really work. It's like what you love. It's yeah. a lifestyle. What I do is a, is a lifestyle. And I think when I started producing records, I had already produced, I produced this one band. Um, God, what were they called? T.S. Uh, toxic shock syndrome tss from venice beach and it was like i was yeah. recording him and we got almost done and i had a little 12 track you know we had spent our money in the, in the electric love hogs on this uh 12 track tape recorder and so the band had broken up and i was recording them on my 12 track and then the end of like the recording session um I, they just they, they got a gang vocal together and they just started going white power and i'm like fuck fuck i just shut down the fucking thing for yeah. the tape up and i said uh i'm out <laughs> i know I did. Yeah, my course. first experience recording another band was like i was like dude we can't i this is i can't do this i don't know yeah. this is the worst worst ever that was fucking awful and then so i stopped i stopped working with other bands until i got to a place where um I met Show Off, this young, these young punk pop punk kids from Chicago. They played the Fireside Bowl with Goldfinger in, in 96. And I'm like, I knew they gave me a demo cassette and it was it just fucking it sounded terrible. But their live show was amazing. I'm like, I knew I could make it better. And that was the first band that really uh, the, um, my friend Chris loaned me his two inch tape machine. So I had a tape machine in my in my house, that house that you saw in Marina Del Rey. And I just, I made an album, John Reese, my old manager, he got them signed to Maverick Records through Guy O'Siri. 
And then because of that, I found another band called Mest. They're from Chicago as well. They opened for us, um, I don't know, so House of Blues, I think, in Chicago. Yeah. And then um, or there was the Metro. They played with us, the Metro. And I signed them. And then I got an A&R deal because I signed these two bands through Guy O'Siri. And that changed everything. I just didn't know that this was going to be part of my existence because I all I came from a place of was I can – I know I can make it better for these bands. I know I can make a better sounding recording because of my history working with Tommy Lee, working with, um, you know, Kendall and Norwood from Fishbone, um, making the Goldfinger first album on my own with Jay Rifkin. Like all those things helped me, gave me the experience to really practice with those bands. And so by the time I found the used, like like they say, 10,000 hours, right? Like I'd done my 10,000 yeah. hours in the studio by the time, by the time I found the used. Yeah. And then of course, uh, they, they, I remember when they were showcasing and you recorded that record and I mean, it did unbelievable. Dude, well. the showcases, the showcases were so fucking awesome, man. It was like, we'd be in the room with Leo Cohen, you know, who was running Island at the time and Tom Wally and all these guys. And he would just, Bert would just have, you would just scream and just throw up in the re in the rehearsals place because he'd scream from his gut so loud he would just throw up and these guys would be like, where do where do we sign? Where do we sign? He, I, remember, I remember he got one of these um one of these executives he got uh like just he threw threw up all over the guy's pants and he was still like, dude, I gotta I gotta have this band. It was game changing. That's man, it's amazing. And you still work with Bert and the guys. Yeah, we made a record last year called Heartwork, um, or maybe beginning of this year. It came out this year, and it's like it's all it's all come full circle because I signed them to Warner Brothers. I had an uh, like an A and R consultancy with Tom Wally, who taught me probably more than any other executive has ever really taught me. You know, he's just a legendary figure in the music business, and and um, and I signed him to Warner Brothers, and then. You know, it's come full circle where I have a, a record label called Big Noise and we were able to sign the used to Big Noise, which is what this last hard work came out on. So I just feel honored to have such a long history with these guys. It's amazing. Who are you working with at, at, at Big Noise with? Is that John Cohen, who I've known for years? <laughs> Johnny Cohen is the best. So John Cohen started Vagrant Records. You know, he signed yeah. Edward Sharp, and he signed every great yeah. emo band ever, you know, yeah. Dashboard Confessional. He signed the 1975. Yeah. So John is my partner, and I have another partner named Nick Gross, and the three of us run this label together. You know, we um, we have a, another label that we've acquired called Commission, Commission Recordings, which uh, we have Made in Tokyo. We have Lil Dicky on the label, you know, and on the big noise side, yeah. we've got the Rex we've got, I mean, so it's just a real, it's been, it's been such an amazing journey, like being able to actually sign bands, make We have a band called girlfriends, which is Travis Mills band. I don't know if you know, Travis that worked over yeah. at Apple. He's a really great guy. Um, and it's been so fun. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing the stuff you've done. And I think about it, you know, your production, I mean, you eventually moved out of the house, moved into a new home and it built a new studio. Tell me about the that what that was that kind of at that point in time where you did you build the dream studio that you always wanted? I did. To yeah, build? NRG was my favorite studio in the world and I found out who made it. This guy Brad Keeler designed the studio at NRG and so I called Brad and I said, "Dude, I I just, you know, we became, we became really good friends Brad and I and he designed and built the studio up in my Roscommer house when I lived in Bel Air. And it was like amazing because we got this, you know, this house in Marina del Rey we bought from this, you know, crack addict you know we were able to like I, I made i made so much money on the sale of that house we were able to move up to bel-air because of this real estate investment i always tell got you know band members and kids that are just like getting these big advances or publishing deals i'm like buy real estate it's the smartest thing i ever did is just buy buy that house and we built this we built this amazing studio up at roscomer and you know that's where i made um and i made the used second and third record up there. I made Foxy Shazam's record up there. I made Panic of the Disco's third album, Vices and Virtues up there. Um, I, I met um, Jason Evigan from uh, After Midnight Project. I made his record up there, who's become an, an, an amazing producer on his on his own. He's just incredible. Um, so we made so many records up there, went over there for, for, for 10 years of my life. And then I moved out to uh, Calabasas and I'm out kind of West Valley now. Which is amazing. You're right by uh, my, uh, my, uh... My my sister who 
you know, Alison Hagendorf, of course, you know, who's, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you guys, she, she is the greatest. Um, but I, and I love that, uh, you know, I mean, even, I mean, the thing that's cool about you, John, is you've worked with a band like the Fever 333, who has elements of, of those things that are like are, are anywhere from public enemy to rage, but also, but they have the hooks as well, which is something that you make sure, but you could also work with a pop artist. Like you, you did so tons of records in five seconds of summer and Hillary Duff and people like that as well. I love the fact that you have such a wide range of ki the kinds of artists that you work with. I think that says a lot about your ability um, that people come to you because you do know the value of a song and a chorus. There was a moment, yeah, there was a moment in time, like after the used and story of the year and kind of the whole kind of screamo thing kind of happened that, you know, on my, a uh, contract was up at Warner Brothers and I was like, what do I want to do next? I'd been, I'd, I'd written a couple songs for uh, Hillary Duff, Mandy Moore. I had written a bunch with uh, Benji and Joel from Good Charlotte. And, uh, and, and I was kind of dabbling in the pop world. So I had this meeting with Clive Davis at the Bel Air, at his Bel Air bungalow at the Bel Air hotel. And it was like, I was a three hour meeting with just him and I, and he was just starting American Idol at the time, whenever this was like, Gosh, it must have been 15, 16, 17 years ago now. And uh, and so he his idea for me was, you know, I was going to write the music for American Idol, all originals for their, uh, you know, for the, um, the the contestants on the show. And I was still touring with Goldfinger. And I'm like, what do I do? And it was like, I wasn't ready. And he was the loveliest man. And it was the greatest meeting. I'll never forget that meeting with him, just sitting there talking about music and life and everything. And I mean, what a legend for me to sit with this guy. And, and I was at this crossroads. I'm like, is this what I want to do? Do I want to stop? Because I knew I would have to stop touring. And I wouldn't really be able to, to develop artists anymore. This, this would be my life. And I passed on it. I said, no, I'm not you know, I still want to, I still want to be out there touring and, and developing new artists. And, and I was, it was like, it was probably the hardest business decision I've ever had to make in my life, you know? And, but it all kind of came around anyway, because by the time I found five seconds of summer, it was like, you know, the industry changes so quickly, like we all know. And, and, and these days it's, it's so much about self-promotion. It's like, it used to be back in the early days, you know, when I was working at labels that the label could really market and promote a band and kind of blow them up off terrestrial radio, off of MTV, off of like all that kind of stuff. Like you'd actually be able to do it by marketing it the right way. But now it's like, it's got to come from the artist. I mean, the artist has to be driving the, pro the marketing yeah. promotion and you've got to have the great song and you've got to have just the whole thing has to be just right. You know, like Machine Gun Kelly's record's a perfect example of kind of how different it is in 2020 to kind of like really make an impact. But, you know, back then when it was like, I dabbled in the pop world and then it kind of went around and I'd have that house in Bel Air and then Tom Wally got fired. He didn't get along with the CEO of the company. So his whole team got fired with him. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to do, man? You know, I'd done this for so long. This is my whole life. A friend of mine, this, this friend of mine, he had the best intentions, but he's like, dude, EDM is the future, man. And he's, he wasn't wrong, but it's like, you know, Skrillex, everyone listens to dubstep back then. He's like, you should, you should be a DJ, like DJ Feldman or what I'm like, Fuck you. That's what people are giving me the advice to do. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do? I, I passed on this on this um, Clive Davis thing. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And then I was on tour. Goldfinger was on tour in England. And my friend Jonathan Daniel called me and said, hey, this friend of mine told me about this band Five Seconds of Summer that um, have this buzz going. You should go check them out at rehearsal space. It was two blocks away from where I was staying. So I walked over to the rehearsal and I met the dudes. And they didn't know who Goldfinger was, but they know they knew, um, they knew uh, All Time Low, all the bands that I had worked with, Good Charlotte. Yeah, Panic. Bands, they yeah. knew them all. And so we just sat there and hung out for like four hours and we became, you know, it was like I was just, you know, I don't even know, like a big brother to these guys or a father figure. It was just an amazing journey. Those guys, they're, they're the sweetest, most driven group of guys that I've, I may have ever met. And, uh, and because of that, it kind of got me back in the pop lane, you know, because, you know, ultimately their music was kind of pop rock, but they were a pop band. So it just kind of came full circle. I think it's great that it did. It's amazing. You mentioned Jonathan Daniel, who was our mutual friend for a year. I love JD. I, I, you probably even knew him back in the days when he was, you know, before he was working in the music industry. Now that he's at Crush. But, yeah, uh, yeah, know, I he think was his band was called Cherry. 
back in the day. Yeah, candy. Like candy. candy. Yeah, candy that's right. Yeah, something like that. I think we played some. Yeah. yeah. And the Electric Angels. So they were cl- had a close name to your name for Electric Angels. I know. That's on. right. So yeah. we, um, yeah, we did those no bozo jams. Back in the day at the Whiskey, they would basically have a back line set up. The same drum kit, same amps would be set up. And a band would have 10 minutes to go play their songs. And so before the Electric Love Hogs were signed, we played – those we would play those things probably every other week and we played shows with jonathan's band back i remember playing one of those shows in axel rose before they were the guns and roses that we all know was sitting on the steps i'm like it was just it was really great back in those days everyone before everyone kind of blew up it was incredible yeah it must have been insane i mean it's 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 i look i look back at that and only imagine what it was like being that i was on the east coast at that period of time you know but I always loved coming out here. And, and you know, I just want to, uh, let's talk also about you. Again, you, one of the things that's amazing that everybody talks about is your ability to work so well and precise, but quickly, John. Say, I've been told that nobody knows their way around gear or around Pro Tools and editing at the speed that you can actually do. Like that you actually have, like, as you can do it as you think it. Like there's this, this is a, that's the word that's out there. And I think that that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's part. I mean, again, it's probably part of the ADD that exists and part of the idea that I did so poorly in school. Like I was kicked out of high school. I, I just I wasn't I was never designed to be a student of of math or history. I did went shit that I wasn't interested in. And, and then when it came to learning how to record and be able to sculpt the music and be able to like actually create soundscapes, it was so exciting to me when I first discovered Pro Tools because you know, Electric Love Hogs made um, our record on two inch tape. Uh, Goldfinger's first record was 48 track digital tape. First band I produced, Show Off, was on two inch tape. So I learned how to align tape machines. I learned how to move microphones around the cone uh, on a on a um, cabinet. You know, and I learned how to get that sweet spot for the guitar tone. All that stuff that you kind of had to do. When I, you know, I went into one on one recording studios when they were making the Black album, and I looked around the room, and they had. I know this isn't like a fucking you know tech uh, podcast, but I'm I'm just it was really no, so interesting. Hands. you know they, this stuff is cool. it was really interesting to me because what they the two inch tape is you know two inches thick and the, and there, there'd be the kick drum up here and the snare drum here on the tape and the, the hi-hat here and they would actually cut a snippet for the kick drum and move it when Lars was rushing a little bit they would just that's how they edited tape to make everything kind of locked in and quantized back in the day and it was so interesting to me how much detail they put into it so when I discovered Pro Tools I was like Everything is right here on the screen. I can see every single track I can do. I can add anything and edit anything and create and massage anything I wanted to. If the singer's rushing, I can move it back. And so I would just spend hours and hours. I mean, I, w- I was working probably 20 hours a day for you know, the first probably four or five years of producing records. I mean, it's all I did when I was you know, d- dating my wife. It's just like my wife and I would, would just take a break for dinner and I would just work another eight hours till four in the morning, get up at 10 and do it all over again. It was like, I learned pro tools backwards and forwards and it's like you know there's all sorts of different you know there's Ab- you know ableton and logic and all these other things exist now fruity loops but it's like pro tools is my thing and hopefully i'm still a ripper i think i'm still a ripper yeah that's what everybody says i mean it's still the word is out there so that's a great thing and i mean with current young artists that you've worked with as well which i think is is brilliant you know so and you know let's talk about the fact that you be you know as far as you know, you've been, uh, you know, there for uh, with animal rights and, and an activist for a really long time. I mean, you're one of the first guys I knew that was vegan, you know, back when we, we first met. Talk to me about where you made that transition when it came to. Uh, so I, yeah, I saw the movie Babe and, and I love the movie. I mean, obviously it won the Academy Award. It's a great film. And I just thought if they could train that pig, why do I choose to eat the pig and not the dog? You know, um, like and I just made a choice to stop you know, eating animals. And I just became, and it just progressed one thing to the next. You know, I'd watched, I just watched a bunch of animal rights videos and slaughterhouse videos. And then I, I, I went into was, I just did, I just became obsessed with the idea that this, the factory farming, the way that we raise animals is just not, it is not okay, you know? And I, I just started, you know, protesting every day before shows I would do these protests outside of Kentucky Fried Chicken or wherever the fuck with a bullhorn and people would harass the shit out of me. It would just be me alone at noon. I mean, this is before the internet. I couldn't like Instagram post, hey, I'm going to be at this 
if this animal rights protest, I would just be me by myself before a show, every city we would go to. It was insane. You know, at one point, um, you know, I was working, uh, you know, I was, I was doing stuff that was probably outside of the typical animal rights uh, window and the the FBI actually came and raided my house up there in Bel Air on, on Roscommon. They came, my wife and I were coming back from working out, and they blocked us off with all these unmarked sedans. There was a helicopter by the house with all these machine guns pointed at us. It was insane. It was right after the Patriot Act happened. Like you know, Ashcroft was running all this stuff, and they were basically saying animal rights activists are terrorists. What happened is the um, the mayor of the city had had been sprayed on his driveway puppy killer because they were they were killing dogs at the shelter, the, 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 the big downtown shelter at the time. And animal rights activists were trying to obviously make it be a no kill shelter. And they thought that we were the ones that spray painted his house and they figured it would be, you know, whatever they spent, fucking fifty thousand dollars with all these FBI agents who raiding our house. And my wife was pregnant at the time. So I was like, man. That, that sort of like, it really scared me. A bunch of my friends went to prison. That really scared me. So I haven't really been front lines, you know, since, um, but I still, still close to my heart. I spent 10 years on the front lines. That's amazing that they came in to your house. That must have been horrifying for you and your. It was fucking. Like, it was like diehard, dude. These fucking guys, and they had a battering ram. They were gonna knock down the front door. It was like it was insane, dude. I felt like uh, you know Bruce Willis or some shit. Like you know, it was it was wild. That is crazy. I mean, that's uh, that's I, I, that's unnecessary. Number one. I mean, I know you know. I, that you're able to do that and, and just bust into people's houses like that. That's crazy. But I'm glad that's all in the past. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Hey, let's talk about the new Goldfinger single. And and I want to know, do we have an album on the horizon? Because I know that you are such a prolific songwriter. Um, it's exciting to have this new track out. Tell me about when you wrote it. I, I try and write a song a day. And when this when the pandemic started, uh, like I knew they, they say an idle mind is the devil's playground. And because of the workaholic that I am, I knew I needed to get busy. So I took out my GoPro and I just told the guys in the band, I'm like, I'm just going to record a live version of one of our songs, Superman. Uh, and, and maybe you guys can record in your own homes on a, on whatever, on your own laptop, send it to me, I'll mix it. And, um, you know, it just did, we did this quarantine video and that just kind of got, because I knew we couldn't, we had, we had two tours that were canceled because of the pandemic. And I knew we had to do something to stay active and relevant. So we did these quarantine videos, which ended up being just like this incredible thing that our fans just latched onto. And it just kind of went beyond the scope of what the kind of Goldfinger typically does when we release music. And so that was sort of the catalyst that drove me to wanting to make a new album. And so I wrote a bunch of songs. Songs. I probably wrote 25 songs. I try and write a song a day, Matt, because I just, I just have, I feel like it's a muscle that I need to keep working on. And so writing music and listening to music to get inspired to write new music is always part of my daily routine. And so, yeah. uh, you know, I, I had written Wallflower was the last song I wrote in what I, what I didn't know was going to be an album, but what now has turned into an album that we're going to, we're going to put out in the next month. I think, I think it's coming out in a month and a half, which I'm really excited about, but wallflower, I just wrote about my wife, you know, my wife, um, you know, is, she's a, just a perfect match for me. And, you know, we've been together for 25 years and she's just amazing. I think you've met her. She's incredible. And, Oh yeah, she's from. I met her at the um, I met her at the Stone Pony, playing a show, playing the show with No Doubt back in 1996. So, which is my old my stomping grounds, you know, Asbury Park, that Jersey area, right? That's where I'm from. Yeah, she's from Medford, which is South Jersey. Yeah. And yeah. I met her in Asbury Park. You know, she was going to Monmouth University, which is ironically where Tom Wally also went to school. But it's like, you know, we, we met and started dating and we've been together ever since. And and I just wrote the song because she's got such a, um, a quiet demeanor. But, you know, inside she's a warrior. And so I wrote this Wallflower song. I mean, I love the movie The Perks of Wallflower. I just man, it was one of those movies. And as a kid that was definitely, um, you know, like all of us, we all have our stories. And I wasn't, you know. I, you know, they say within the four agreements that you get to choose who your parents are, but I'm not so sure. I mean, I, look, I, I've come to terms when my father died, we were good. But as a kid, man, it was really fucking tough. And so the Perks of Wallflower really spoke to me, you know, as just having, you know, these these 
you know, this kind of teenage growing up scenarios, like the, the coming of age movie. And I, I felt like it was a great combination of a song about my wife combining with the idea of this great coming of age movie. And, um, and that's how Wallflower came to be. Yeah. Oh, it's a great song. And I'm, and you know, it's cool. I met your wife last time I saw you with your wife was during the pandemic when they first opened restaurants a little bit and you guys were out for your anniversary at uh Travis's. Was oh, it, oh yeah. 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 At Crossroads. Yeah. Travis had hooked us up. Um, Travis Parker. Yeah. I remember it when the uh, manager came over and said, uh, are you John Feldman? And he asked me, he goes, Wait, do you know, John, do you know John Feldman? I'm like, yep. He's right behind me. And that's when you and I, saw each other we were, we were at tables next to each other yeah that was that was uh yeah that was what, what like a like five four months ago now yeah it flew by you know which is pretty amazing but uh i think that's great you guys are celebrating your anniversary which was beautiful you know i mean 25 years is amazing you know and yeah she's seen you go through a lot of things right and she's witnessed yeah incredible. she's witnessed all of it you know we have um you know we have two kids together and and she's watched the, the whole thing kind of my progression as a guy in a band to becoming a producer and just kind of witnessing the whole growth of me my, my career and me as an artist it's been um it's been really great and she's put up with so much god i was producing this band escape the fate and and at the time the guitar player was a raw vegan and we only had one bathroom you know that, that, that he could use in the house in Roscommon, so he he would take these these poops, these raw vegan poops at two in the morning. We'd be recording and it would smell so bad. It would wake my wife. My, my wife would get woken up from a sleep thinking someone had died in our house. <laughs> Something else had died. It smelled so bad. And it was like she's just been through, you know, everything. You know, she's she when you know, when Callum from Five Seconds to Summer turned 18, you know, she's the one that had to hire the stripper for the party. You know, she's the one that took everyone out to the strip club in Vegas when we were, you know, kind of on, you know, on tour with Five Seconds of Summer. It was just like, she's had to do so much shit. Most wives would be like, fuck no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I think it's great, man. It's, you guys are obviously a perfect match and, and you have two children and that's fantastic. How have your kids been doing during the pandemic too, Johnny? Have they, how is that? Uh, are they back to doing school partially? Or are they cool, yeah, right school is all on Zoom? It's all remote. Um, and they love it. I mean, they, they're like, cause in between classes, they just get to play video games or talk to their friends on FaceTime, you know, and I take them boxing. Yeah. I try and take them out bike riding to get them some exercise. But for the most part, they love it so much more than, um, actually having to go to class, which is weird because they're both kind of social kids, but I think having to get up earlier and like, drive to school, like they never love that part of it, you know, but my daughter just yeah. went into eighth grade. My, my, my daughter's going, I'm sorry, into sixth grade. My son's going into ninth grade. Or that's what they're in now. So uh, middle school and high school. And they don't even get to go to their new schools until this thing's over. It's so weird. It is the craziest time, you know? I mean, the important thing is just that we're there to support our loved yeah. ones, you know? You know, my daughter just moved here from Brooklyn to moved in with me here in Los Angeles. Cause, and I'm glad she's here. It's nice to have my family around, you know? Oh, yeah, that's but awesome, yeah, so I'm glad she's here. But yeah, New York City was getting a little too hairy, so she decided to come out uh, to the West Coast, which she's been to visiting me before many times. But anyway, but Johnny, I got to tell you how much I love having you on. And now let's talk about some of your favorite, most influential albums of your life, because your musical taste is great. It's really, and you know, I'm seeing the list in a different order, but I, well, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna start. We'll start at the top, which is the Replacements. Let it be. What a great record. Their last album on uh on their label of twin tone and just what an incredible record this was i mean i will dare right yeah. tell me why this is such an important album to you i mean how young are you how old am i let's count the rings around my eyes i mean that that paul westerberg lyric just i mean that's the first song on the album it just sucks you in immediately and to me westerberg is the greatest lyricist of my generation or at least my you know kind of the generation right before me like he i met him once when i was on tour we played a radio show together josh freeze was his, was his drummer who i know josh introduced me to him and i told him like we cover skyway you know what um you know and he's like that's one less song i have to play is what he said to me and he was just he, he was a really nice guy and it was just uh man what an album i mean let it be for me it's just like that was coming off of uh you know, sorry, Ma, for gonna take out the trash. Uh, Hoot Nanny was coming off of these records that were really garage-sounding punk records. And we really yeah. started experimenting with 
just bigger sounds, you know, the guitar player for REM played on I Will Dare, you know, on the record, he's playing that lead part. It's like, they just kind of like push the envelope. And as a lyricist, it's like, um, Androgynous is one of the greatest songs you know, ever written as far as I'm concerned. The way he um, unsatisfied, the way Westerbrook sings unsatisfied, look me in the eye and tell me, are you satisfied? It's like, holy shit. Like, yeah. it's just, it's so earnest and so believable. To me, Paul Westerberg is my Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, he was, what a great songwriter. A hundred percent. I love him. You know, I mean, and uh, he's one of those guys that uh, has so, so many people are inspired by him. And, uh, you know, it started to seem like seem like he was going to be getting his due around the time of singles when he did Waiting for Somebody, you know, and Dyslexic Card on there. But uh, Replacements remain, you know, one of the most influential bands because of him. Yeah. And that's, that's I saw them. I saw them so many times back in the day when I was just a kid, you know, when I was just a kid trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And, you know, I saw them play a great show at the Palladium. I saw them play at the, at the um, country club out here in the Valley. And they were fucking terrible drunk and so i saw the, i saw the whole gamut of what you know they kind of were and i loved it all i just never felt ripped off i just felt like this is exactly the kind of band i want i just want to be that kind of manic loose live energy that they have yeah and they really did they were great I, you know you're like me i've seen them on good nights and on drunken nights you know because back on the east coast city gardens in trenton and places like that but uh, they were they were so great now the next record you picked we love uh second album from one of the greatest trios of all time the police and regatta de blanc what an incredible record this is tell me why you love this one so well you know i was always a wannabe drummer i just as, as a kid i just i always loved the drums and most of the records i listened to and and i was i was such a stoner in high school i just i was too stoned to be able to get it together to get a drum kit to carry it around in a car i mean i, I didn't get my license till i was 18 i was i was just so fucking loaded on drugs and drinking but like i would always air drum everything like i'm i'm arguably the best air drummer there is on the planet there's actually a video there's a song that i i, I recorded and produced called cynical on the California record Blink that there's a video, a YouTube video of me and Travis Barker. He's rehearsing the song on a pad and I'm behind him air drumming. you got to fucking check it out. It is it's really good. Great. But um, I mean, I can play, you know, Message in a Bottle on Regatta de Blanc. I can play, I mean, every field of the end. And it's like, I know Stuart Copeland in hindsight and as a producer and as a guy that understands how records are made. Like, I'm sure I'm sure they recorded Stuart front to back. And it's like some of the fills at the end of the song, I'm sure were, um, were not, you know, it's not like he punched them in. It just came out organically and naturally. I mean, Stuart to me is... I mean, it's like for me, it's, you know, Travis Barker is my favorite drummer and Stuart Copeland's my second favorite drummer of all time. And uh, I just, you know, no time this time at the end of the record where he just says that roll at the end of that song. It's like, yeah. and it's the influence, you know, for me as, you know, in Goldfinger, the police are, the police are probably my biggest influence because they were such a massive band when I was in high school. And, you know, I was a bass player in Family Crisis, my first band. And so learning those lines and learning how to palm mute the way, um, I think the bed's too big without you was on that record as well. And I think like learning how to yeah. play that song and palm mute it, it was like, it was such an influence on me as a musician and like trying to sing those songs, like my voice, I can't sing in that, that kind of high tenor that Sting has, like, but trying to sing that high, it was just like that record. I had it as a, a two 10 inch record set. I had, yeah. it, it was a smaller one with two yeah. inch records. It was cool when they were doing it back then. They did that for that. And Joe Jackson looked sharp. They had two of them on the 10 inches. I had that I had that look sharp record too on two ten inches and it was like I, I just uh man I would just listen to that album over and over and just study the drums. I mean just the whole thing. It's funny how Andy Summers is such a legendary guitar player, but he gets so overlooked and some of the guitar playing on that album is uh, is just like I mean that guitar riff in Message in a Bottle is I mean I don't know. I mean, learning that add nine chord that, do, do, yeah. do, do, you know, that chord yeah. is like integral to how I write music even today, you know? Yeah. One of the greatest riffs ever, in my opinion. I love that. That's one of those songs that, you, you know, I think it's just one of the best written songs ever. 
I love message in a bottle for that reason. You know, so good. And his playing, yeah, Andy Summers. Have you watched that documentary that can't stand losing you surviving yeah. the police? I've seen all, I've seen everything. I've read everything. I'm just yeah. like, I'm You're a like fan, super fan. All yeah. of it. Just the historically, like how just me, I, there has been a lot of, you know, head butting with drummers, whether I'm producing a drummer of a band or whether it's a drummer in my own band, yeah. like Ben and, and just studying how Sting and Stewart butted heads so much um it just made me feel like things are maybe things aren't as bad as i think if this happened to arguably the greatest songwriter or the most successful songwriter in in rock you know in the last 40 years sting um if he had to deal with it then maybe it's okay that i have to deal with it too yeah absolutely yeah you those stories are, are notorious with those guys you know as, as great as they were they're there are issues, but you know what? The music they made was so fantastic, and I'm and I'm glad they reformed that that tour they did when they, they reunited was amazing too. It was so good. yeah, I saw two of them. Yeah, it was great. It was amazing. Now the next record is Social Distortions, Mommy's Little Monster. Great record from these guys, and you know, let's talk about this because you were ten years old when you discovered this record. You were a kid. Yeah, I was a kid, and um. And look, so my best friend in high school, his name was Chris Caton. And Chris used to tour manage Social Distortion. So by the time, like, I learned how to play the bass and Chris kind of turned me on to, like, you know, punk rock. He was in a band called Urban Assault from Salt, Salt Lake Tahoe. That's how we got um, South Lake Tahoe. And uh, he he basically got us the tour with Seven Seconds. He grew up with all those, all those guys. And so by the time I found Mommy's Little Monster, it was like that record spoke to me just more so than the clash, the sex pistols, um, because these, they were songs about, you know, the cops and parents and school and, and relationships. And it's just like, and it was Southern California. I grew up in the Bay area, but it was like, it was from, they were California kids. And Chris Caden brought the band to my house as a kid when I was 15, you know, I met the whole band uh, except for Mike Ness. I met Mike Ness much later in life, but it was like, I met those guys and I can play that record, you know, start to finish. I watched that movie, Another State of Mind, which was Social Distortion and, and uh, Minor Threat on tour together. And it was like watching them in that school bus and the whole thing. And like, just Another State of Mind is one of the greatest punk rock songs ever written. You know, um, Mommy's Little Monster shoots methadrine. Mommy's Little Monster had sex at 15. It was like that lyric like no one was talking about that kind of that kind of shit, like shooting drugs and having underage sex. You know, when I was 15, he yeah. spoke to me. You know, that was my voice. Mike Ness was my voice. It's the only band tattoo I have is a social distortion tattoo. And when we would open Family Crisis would open every set with the creeps. I just want to give you the creeps. You know, it's like that was our our kind of like call to arms song, you know, when we were like, we basically did all originals and then social distortion songs. I mean, that was yeah. it. And it's like that album cover is so iconic. It was just like so apocalyptic the whole way that it was just the black and white. Everything was just legendary. And uh, you know, one of the, one of the, I mean, I don't know who's cooler in the history of humanity other than Mike Ness. Yeah, he is. And what a great guy too. He's just a, a really sweet guy, man. Amazing songwriter, great performer, and uh, and good people. Great human being, that's for sure, man, in my experience with him. Oh, yeah. You know, obviously the Beatles are are where so much starts for so many of us. And Revolver is such a great album. Uh, let's talk about that because it's, uh, you know, obviously it's right in the middle of their career, but such an incredible record and so many different things going on in it. Why is Revolver your favorite album? Why? I mean, look, I feel like they really started experimenting on Rubber Soul, but but Revolver, they had honed in. Um, you know, George Martin, I, I would study his music under headphones, the way yeah. he would record different instrumentations. And with the ADT, the, the short delays that he would throw on John Lennon's voice because it was this, this doubling effect because John Lennon hated his voice and he would just put that on. But I, I think Eleanor Ribby's... I mean, arguably my one of the best songs ever written in the history of music. And it's just like this record. Um, I don't know. It's just tomorrow never knows. 
um, got to get you into my life. Like these songs will stand the test of time forever. Like this yeah. is a forever record that will be looked on as, I mean, the greatest songwriting team of all time, Lennon McCartney. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've met Ringo a bunch and he's the loveliest man ever. Yeah, I, mean, he is great. I, I know the guy, it's just like crazy that I, I know a Beatle and it's like yeah. Revolver is to me, you know, before they got, too fan too crazy on kind of the lsd experimentation with i mean obviously sergeant peppers is you know legendary but revolvers the songs are still like three minutes you know they they kind of kept it you know for my add it like kept in line with what i i love then i always say to bands that i work with you know on on the white album they put blackbird and helter skelter back to back on the album just to show the dichotomy of what you can do stylistically as an artist to have such a tender song like blackbird with at the time the heaviest song ever written helter skelter which basically started black sabbath and all these bands to play heavy music but they were able to do that you know, the Beatles are just one of those bands that I, I I make a lot of artists I work with study that aren't as familiar with them as, you know, you or I would be. Yeah. And I don't blame you because, I mean, that music is timeless. Those records are great. And you're right about that with the White Album, too. Now, the next record you uh, picked was one of Coldplay's later records, which is Ghost Stories. Tell me about why this record is so important to you. Um. Ghost stories came along, you know, I have this, uh, I have this issue with sleep apnea, this crazy where I, I just wasn't sleeping. And I was like, I was, I tried everything, the fucking Darth Vader yeah. machine though. I tried everything I get it. and I have this jaw surgery and, you know, I'm sober a long time and I had this surgery that was trying to fix my sleep apnea where they moved my jaw forward and it just went horribly wrong. It fucked with my voice and I had to have like eight consecutive surgeries over the course of a month and a half. And it was like, I almost died. And it was like, I had, I had two young children and I was going through this thing and, and ghost stories. I would just, at the end of the day, you know, because I'm not, I'm not doing drugs. I wasn't like drinking through it or, or, or self-medicating. I was just, I just went through this horrible ordeal and ghost stories is just that record. Like that song midnight, it's like the production of it and the ambient noises, of that song, like, um, true love. It's like, I know at the time, Chris Martin was going through a divorce and he was writing these songs that were so heartfelt, but it's not like the kind of record you can really imagine besides a sky full of stars. Um, I, I couldn't really imagine the song being played live, but yet they recorded the entire record, you know, live, you know, front to back. And it was like the soundscape on that record that the drummer did so much of the programming. It's like just this incredible. And I know it's not like maybe their most popular record, but for me, it's probably the best you know, modern production that I've ever heard this record. It's so ambient and it just, it just makes me re it, it, it when during that really tough time in my life, it just it just calmed me down. It just like it made me just realize that music is still the answer. You know, if I'm angry, I can listen to Fever 333 or Rage Against the Machine and go work out like a motherfucker. And, and at the end of the day, after a long 17 hour day, I can listen to ghost stories and just go into a whole different world. Yeah. And I love that. I think it's great. Chris Martin and those guys are a great band. They really are. I mean, they've done a lot of made a lot of great records. They really have, you know, and I'm and I think it's cool that you picked that record. I really do. And I, one of the next ones is, I mean, talk about incredible production. Roy Thomas Baker working with the guys, the geniuses in Queen on their fourth album, Night at the Opera. So before before I met Chris Caton, who really um you know, kind of shaped me as a, a punk rock youngster. Like it, it, it was like a lot of kids. Like I, I had the Star Wars soundtrack when I was probably 10 or 11. And then I discovered Queen, you know, and, and then I discovered The Who. And it's like Queen were the first band that I was like, this is like, this is what I want to, this is what I want to do. All I want to do after school is listen to music. And I would sit under headphones and listen to this record. And it's like Death on Two Legs, the opener of this album. It's like the shit that Brian May does on guitar and the way that they pan like across the stereo field is incredible because they're on a, you know, I'm assuming they're on, they're obviously they're on two inch tape. They're on, uh, you know, a console and they're having to do it manually. Like there's not, there, I don't think there was a lot of automation that was happening back in those days. And no. it's like 
the production on this record is second to none. I mean, it is just like, I mean, obviously they, they, they took from the Beatles, but a lot of times with the Beatles, like Jeff Emmerich, their engineer would do stereo mixes after everyone went home because back in those days, people didn't have stereos. They just had mono record players. And so they just yeah. didn't think people were going to be listening. They'd spend an hour on a stereo mix. So, you, so Jeff Emmerich would pan everything, all the drums to the right, all the vocals to the left. And it's like, I think Queen took from that style of mixing for A Night at the Opera. And it's like, obviously, Bohemian Rhapsody is, um, and it's probably my son's favorite song. We listen to that song probably every other day. And it's yeah. just like, to what I think about, I guess, and obviously we, I saw, we, I mean, I don't know if you, I'm sure you, sure you saw the movie as well. It was, yeah. I thought it was an incredible movie. But the idea of, um, of writing, kind of having the vision, Freddie Mercury having the vision for that song must have been so challenging back then before computers, like to put it together. You know, um, I don't want to die, but sometimes wish I hadn't been born at all. It was like that lyric as a kid when I was struggling with anxiety and depression, where do I fit in getting kicked out of school and doing drugs and drinking like that lyric spoke to me so much of like, yes, you know, it's not like I hate my life, but sometimes wish. It's like that lyric is so good. And, and you know, lazing on a Sunday afternoon, it's like these songs were so weird. It was like, you know, they go from rock to this ragtime to this opera. And it's just like, that's the kind of music I love. And I guess why ultimately, like as a kid, I really kind of did fail as a punk rocker because I loved so many different styles of music. And back in the early 80s, like if you admitted to liking Duran Duran back in the early punk rock days, you would be excommunicated from the movement. Like you couldn't admit that. And I loved so many different kinds of music and Queens, a band that I always just, and it, you know, it just didn't matter to me what he wore or his sexual preference or anything. It, the music was all that mattered to me with Queen. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. It was so great. And uh, I rem I know what you're talking about with Duran Duran, but it, you know, people can't deny those first two Duran Duran albums are great. Oh, dude, Girls on Film, so yeah. Planet Earth. I mean, this shit is so yeah. good. And I was a bass player, so I just I just loved it. But um, yeah. but again, it was like, you know, we were in this like little bubble of a scene that it's you know, at the time that like you really just you were you could only be punk rock or you were just fucking cast away. So yeah. it's hard to, and you know, in hindsight, it's only 2020 because I can now look back and thank God I had so many influences as a kid because it helped me be such a um, better producer for artists. He absolutely did, which is great. Now, the last album that you picked is one of my favorite albums of all time as well. I mean, there's there's more than one on this list because they're so great. Your list is phenomenal. Um, I love it. And Quadrophenia is just one of the, to me, it's, I mean, I it could be, it's it's definitely one of my favorite albums of all time. It's a contender for my favorite album of all time. I, I mean, there's it, it switches as you know. You know, you like yeah, one. yeah. It was it was hard. It was really hard to pick. You know, seven. I mean, look, there yeah, are, no, there I, are so. I mean, Buzzcocks. Uh, you know, a, 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 a new music in a different kitchen, yeah. different attention. I mean, those records changed my life. It's like even Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. Yeah, Nirvana's you know Bleach. Yeah, all yeah. those. But it's like Quadrophenia. Like as a kid, I watched that movie how my my friend jay min had the vhf s of the movie so we would go to his house after school we would watch it every day and that scene on in the alleyway when you know um jimmy and steph have sex it was like i would that was like porn it was like it was the best fucking scene yeah. of any movie i had ever seen in my life and i would watch that thing and that movie just spoke to me just the drug abuse and not fitting in anywhere and being split personality and having like all these different thoughts and the craziness and bipolar all that stuff spoke to me and that record like i mean and twistle like i said as a bass player i was always attracted to these great bass players and Entwistle. I mean, even Tommy Stinson from The Replacements is legendary bass player, but you know, yeah. Entwistle, like the real me opening up with that song with the, you know, on the, you know, mm -hmm. I, I actually had, I mean, this is the studio version of the, the picture that you have up, but I had the album soundtrack, which had just Jimmy standing in his trench coat on the cover. Yeah, and, it had the one, and it had the one side also of the, uh, of like the all the old songs. Yeah. And all, all the, the old songs. cover songs, you know, yeah. um, so, so that was the album I had, and it was like it started with the um, the sound of the ocean, which I think is the same. It sounded with the sound of the ocean, yeah. and, and in the background with a bunch of reverb. Can you see the real me? Can you? Can you? And just yeah. in with that, 
with that yeah. bass part. And it's like, I was just in immediately. And, you know, Townsend, again, like we're talking about like this upper echelon of songwriters that are just untouchable. And Pete yeah. Townsend is one of them. You know, for me as a kid, I was like, this is, you know, and, and, and you'd hear stories about Pete jumping in the air, landing on his knees and cracking both of his kneecaps. And like we talked about earlier with the exploding drum and like these things that like as a kid, I couldn't imagine doing. It was like rock stars were larger than life back then. They were like demigods, you know? And yeah. so I would, I would look up to this and, you know, Quadrophenia with, um, you know, uh, 515, like all these songs about look, right. Just taking the, taking the train. Like I, I, I didn't relate on any level other than the music was what connected me to it because, you know, grow, growing up in, in the suburbs of Northern California, like I wasn't taking the tube or the, tra or the train a a anywhere, you know, but it's like, um, God, that album is just every time. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what I did. There's a band called the King Blues I produced in in um, in England, and I was able to make the record actually in in London. And I took a train down to Brighton, and I listened to this album start to finish. I was jet lagged, so I got up before the sun was up at four in the morning. Took a train, and when the sun was coming up, I walked the Brighton Pier and listened to Quadrophenia front to back on the pier. It was wow. So fucking cool that's the coolest thing ever man because you know i've been to that pier i've been on that pier before where it says welcome to the pleasure dome the original one and then you know it had the dodgem cars you know and it wanted, wanted to burn down but believe me i uh i've been there and i remember of course it's on a quadrophenia in a minute yeah, love love ran over me that scream yeah. that daltrey has it's like what that, are the um, like god he, i mean he sounds like I, i've always wanted to be able to scream like daltrey and it's just my my voice isn't built that way. It's just not. You know, it's funny. You, you, you know, I mentioned, you know, one time when I was doing, we were doing MTV Beach House, right? Not too far from where Tom Wally's from in Point Pleasant, where I lived for a while in Jersey. I remember I was on the air and I was, I, I repeated that lyric, a beach is a place where a man can feel he's the only soul in the world's where the world that's real. Excuse me, I'm hesitating. And, but you did exactly what a huge Who Quadrophenia fan want to do. You did it. You were on the pier on the beach in Brighton, listening to that album walking. That's like one of the coolest things ever. That's oh man, I used to have, I used to collect Vespas, you know, back when Goldfinger first started taking off and I'd bring a Vespa on tour with us, you know? I mean, it's like Sting was in the, in the movie. I mean, the whole thing, like the Ace Face, it was yeah. like, that whole thing. It's just influenced me so much as a kid, just the way that I, you know, the way that I look, you know, with, you know, wearing the, 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 the tip like uh, polo shirts and the, and the suits, the whole thing. Like I always wear a suit on stage and it's like that movie in that era, just, you know, that mod culture influenced me fat, you know, fashion wise. Yeah. More than anything. Yeah, it was amazing. All that stuff was so great. And I love you mentioned the Buzzcocks, love the jam, love all that stuff was so great back then. And, you know, it's funny, you mentioned a different kind of tension. Just the song that came into my mind like last, last two nights ago was You Say You Don't Love Me on that record. And what a great tune. Yeah, Goldfinger, Goldfinger covers You Say You Don't Love Me. We have a covers record called Darren's Coconut Ass. And yeah, I remember it. You Say You Don't Love Me is on that. And that was the first record that I heard that the bass guitar and the kick drum were locked in exactly they played the same thing do 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 with a do 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 it was like and i'm like how does he make the bass guitar sound like this and i realized it was the kick drum playing along with it it was like as a kid realizing those kind of moments shaped me as a producer and an engineer yeah which is amazing it's so great all those records are so important in your history John, man, I, I got to tell you how much I loved having you today. I, I just, it's the best. It, before we leave, tell me about a couple of things you're working on right now that we can look forward to. I mean, we're excited about the next Goldfinger record, so that's no top of the list, right? So we're excited. About <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing so much, and it's like interesting because people don't really make albums the same way they used to. Like I'm right. with, like kind of a different a different artist a lot. You know, I just wrote a song, Travis Barker and I work a lot together. He lives a block from my house and he's one of my best friends on the planet. And so, you know, we're working on this. Um, I don't know if it's going to be an album or a, or, or an EP like this, you know, some new blink songs we're doing, you know, I just wrote a song with Travis that I guess, you know, we got, you know, trippy red machine gun Kelly on, I'm finishing up another fever three, three, three album, just working with this kid, Josiah that, uh, 
um, that Travis turned me on to, this kid named Mod's son, who's Mod like, um, great. Great. Yeah, Mod's yeah. Great, have an album coming out with him in a couple weeks, you know, an Atreyu, a new, another Atreyu album is coming out, uh, I think next month, and Escape the Fate album's coming out. So it's kind of all over the place. It's like, yeah. I'm working a lot, a lot with these kind of like younger, um, I guess, emo rap, kind of kids you know like yeah. this, you know jutes and just a bunch of that new school stuff and then i'm doing metal and then i'm doing goldfinger right in the middle with the scott yeah. Hunt. i love it yeah oh it's great man because you can do you can straddle all those lines and that's a beautiful thing because you have that talent john thanks for so much for doing this today man i loved it and uh i'll be looking forward to that new goldfinger record and keeping an eye on everything else that you're doing as well it's thank always- you matt you're the best and i love you brother you know that it's- you do Love you know, you, man. long time friendship, and I'm and I'm glad, man. I'm glad we're both here and we're doing our thing, and it's it's just so great to have you on the show. So, Johnny, I will Thank see you. you soon. All right, my brother. All right, homie. Thank you, buddy. You got it. Excellent, John Feldman. Everybody, he was so good, man. How great was John? I'll tell you, he blows me away. I love him. Everything about him because he's it's his energy, it's his passion, and his talent. I mean, you know, he's got all three of the things working for him in a big way, and. An incredible human being who helps out a lot of other people. Does a lot of good things for for people. I mean, not just in, in musically, but just for people in general. Uh, gives a lot of himself and is of service in so many ways. So he is he is one of the great ones, as far as I'm concerned. And that was great. So thanks for joining us today on In a Lonely Place. Remember, you're never alone. If you got music in your life, please uh, take good care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay sane. Thanks for watching the show. I'll be back with you next week.